set. Come in on five, four, three, two. Hello, good evening and welcome to the second episode of Tarn Watch. So these three live broadcasts are to bring you uh, the perspectives and ideas and all the things that the students have learnt over the three days of this British Ecological Society um, Squirmer School for 16 to 18 year olds. So we have 31 students here from uh, seven different schools across the UK and uh, they're certainly working hard, they're doing a whole range of activities from, from sort of sun up to sundown all through this week and we're facilitating them sharing their stories today. So last night we had a huge thunderstorm, uh, it was very spectacular, I think everyone was awake at about two o'clock this morning, um, which was a little bit unfortunate in that we had uh, some moths traps out uh, and so they got a little bit drenched but it still worked very well and I'm joined by my first guest who is Sunny who's going to talk about uh, the moths that he caught. So yes. First up, I've got a picture of the moth traps. Can you tell me how these work? Yes, so here in the centre, just under this uh, white dish you see here, you've got a very bright LED bulb. Uh, and it's basically, you know moths, they love light. So essentially, when it's nice and dark out, this bright shining beacon, they flock to it. Mm -hmm. And after a little while, you know, moths love light, but it gets a bit much, so they need somewhere to stay for shelter. Mm -hmm. And you see at the uh, bottom here, obviously, it's just not on the screen anymore, uh, there's egg boxes that provide perfect little cubby holes for these moths to shelter in for the night, which is then where we take the trap back in the morning very early, six day rise, very brutal. <laughs> and then we take them out, uh, very carefully sort of guide the moths into uh, little test, not test tubes, but captures we can look at them through. All right, so we've got a little bit of footage um, of yes. moths in all of the tubes yeah. uh, that you got. Some of them large, some of them fluttery, some mm -hmm. of them both. And there's a lot of moths there. A hell of a lot of moths. Yeah. Yeah, but it, and it's funny too because obviously when you see moths out in the wild, you tend, you, you're not really looking at what type of moth it is. You're just like, okay, that's a moth. I know why it's here because I put my torch on or something mm -hmm. and you're just trying to get it to leave you alone. But when you start looking at these things at closer detail and trying mm -hmm. to identify them, there's actually a lot of difference in just the same species of moth, let alone the different types of moth you can get in one area. Right. So how did you go about identifying them? I can see books there and it looks yeah. like you've got some... Well, we had some very informative resident experts on hand, as uh -huh. like Dan, as you'll talk to in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the books were very useful. They had keys, so you'd go through the antennas, the, uh, the wing shapes, the thoraxes of the, uh, the moths, and you'd essentially work out what species of moth it was, and then you'd go through looking at the patterns and comparing it to the diagrams in the book and work out which types of moths you actually had looking at. They've got some great names too, haven't they? Some oh, they've got some wonderful names. names. So I think this is one of your videos. Can you tell me about this moth? Yes, uh, this is an antler moth. This is a very common moth that we got. We must have gotten about 10, 15 of these lot. Mm -hmm. um, but all sorts of different shapes and sizes, male, female, some of them very large, some of them very small. Uh -huh. uh, extremely common in this area. And um, surprising too, because they're not the usual type of moth you might get in your house. They're very, I think, more outdoorsy kind of moths, because I haven't seen any in my house anyway. Right. So I get the impression you quite enjoyed this. Oh, it was a lot of fun, you know. It's funny because at the beginning of the week I really had no idea what entomology was and I truly feel ready for a PhD. <laughs> That's brilliant to hear. That's fantastic. Um, I missed much of the moth session, it was a little bit early for me, but I did enjoy coming down and seeing just the sheer numbers and diversity of yeah, moths. Yeah, it's crazy. We did not expect the yield that we got, I have to say. Particularly with the thunderstorm. Yeah, honestly, we were expecting, you know, maybe some of the moths worked out that they should get out of Dodge whilst they could in the thunderstorm, but perhaps they find the egg box is just that comforting. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining me, Sunny, and sharing um, you. your perspectives on what you learned here. We're now going to go to an interview that we recorded yesterday uh, that three of the students, Latifa, Mariam, and Izzy, recorded with my colleague, Yosef. Oh, I forgot. We've got a little <laughs> bit of them being released. <laughs> Do you want to have a quick look at that? Yeah, let's go for it. All right, so um, you didn't kill the moths, but rather... Uh, no, they're actually them. very important for the uh, ecosystems, we found out. I won't get into the details now, as you know, there's, in, there's other stuff going on. Uh -huh. But you'll see the very professional manoeuvres of just kind of yeeting them out of the uh, little captures they came in. But it's actually, it's quite funny, despite how much they flutter whilst they were in there, the minute you take the lid off, they refuse to fly out half of them. <laughs> they would just kind of stay there or land in your hand and refuse to go. 
Brilliant, that's marvellous. Thank you very much. So this time we will actually go to uh, the interview with Yosef. So here we go. Thanks, Sonny. Thank you. Welcome back, guys. I'm Marion. This is Isaac and this is the team So today we're having Yosef from the Open University and we're going to be asking him some questions. So please continue. Alright, so Yosef, never make my own trailer. I just wanted to ask him, how is it like living in a trailer? Uh, yes, uh, it's very much like here. The only difference is uh, climate and, and uh, location. Uh, one of the key things and one of the universal things in ecology is that uh, the needs and wants are very similar. Uh, so plants here elsewhere need water, sunlight and nutrients. And the same as human beings, we need food, we need uh, shelter and clothes. So it was very similar in a way. Uh, you may call it there is unity in diversity. Yeah. Okay. So, um, no doubt there's no resources in Eritrea. Did that prevent you from furthering your research to the best of your abilities? Uh, one of the key things is everywhere in the world has its own challenge, whether it is physical, environmental, or social. Uh, in a sense, uh, I think uh, there was always a place for environment and agricultural research. So one of our key problems there was deforestation and there was a massive uh, reforestation or replanting of new trees and seedlings being undertaken. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, I was more focused about making new trees rather than taking care of established trees which I am doing here. Uh, and in terms of water issues, uh, there, there are the biggest problem was the quantity of water availability, whereas in this part of the world I am more concerned about the quality of the water availability. So there is always uh, a place for environmental uh, and research. Um, what inspired you to become a food and environment um, ecologist? Was it because of any challenges, opportunities, or did you always love biology in general? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I kind of came across it because partly I was exposed to it. Uh, I grew up in a city and I really didn't have much interaction with the natural world. But uh, I went to an open day at the local university and uh, one of our teachers says that, you know, uh, if you can feed a person, he says you can solve the world's problems. Uh, he mentioned that food is important in terms of uh, keeping the peace, keeping people happy and bringing communities together. Mm -hmm. So I decided, uh, let me study that. And uh, I enjoyed it so much that I will probably do it again. Yeah. But as I progress in my career, I learned that actually the environment is also another important complement to that. So in my further degrees, I went to do ecology. <laughs> um, as our last question to like close everything, yeah, close everything we might ask you how do you see the future of policy in the world around food security? Uh, one of the key things I learned in academic research and looking at uh, you know how the world runs is it often takes us a bit too long to understand the implications of what we are doing mm -hmm. and sometimes we get to do too little too late. But there is no uh, reason not to not to try and not to strive. And I'm pleased to say that, uh, that there is a lot more interest in understanding the failings of our food system yeah. and also understanding of the social justice issues around that. And there are always uh, some approaches to us. We are more environmentally aware. Our politicians are more in touch with the environmental and social issues, mm -hmm. and you, young people, are also more inspired to this. So there is hope after all. Yeah. yeah. All right. So thank you guys for tuning in to watch the interview with you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I will be back again hopefully. Yeah. Bye. 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 
So some brilliant questions there from Latifa, Izzy and Mariam, um, and some really inspirational words from Yosef as well. So now my next two guests are Sadia and Laurel, and they're going to talk about one of my favourite activities that we've done this week. So we've got some great images to show. Uh, so perhaps uh, I need to just press mute. Uh, can you tell me about what's going on here? What are these? Um, so these are ground beetles, which mm -hmm. were actually caught, um, I think, on Monday. Yeah. And so what we did with these ground beetles yesterday is um, we covered them in UV fluorescence powder. Mm -hmm. And um, so what this powder does is it is kind of useful in like tracking, you know, where the bugs are like going. So you just shine the UV light on it and then it's like clear to see like where the bugs are like, you know, heading towards. Great, so that, that's the powder we can see here is yeah. just in yeah. normal light and then we can cross... And, um, the UV powder is also beneficial um, compared to using insecticides as well. It's like a, um, an alternative to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, so what can we see here um, in this um, image? As you can see, there's like different colours mm -hmm. and the different colours can be used on um, different types of beetles. So um, when you're collecting data, you can um, see what types of beetles have interacted as well. And yeah, it causes like a domino effect. So when one beetle has um, the fluorescence powder, mm -hmm. it can pass into another beetle as well. Right, so you put one re colour on one beetle. Oh, we've yeah. got some different colours on this next one, haven't we? Um, so you put one colour on one beetle, yeah, another yeah. colour on another beetle. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty amazing, yeah. Yeah, so how might you use this? How could you use this in the field, do you think? So you could use it as an alternative to insecticides. Mm -hmm. So as you know that, you know when farmers like use insecticides, they kind of use them on like the whole of the land. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you know like where the ground beetles are, like where the masses are, mm -hmm. then you'll be able to like just use it in that specific area, which makes it more cost effective. Yeah. And environmentally friendly as well. Right, so yeah. you can use sort of a, like a biological control or something in this particular place yeah. and add this powder so that you yeah. know where those beetles have gone and where that biocontrol has done. So you can just put it in very specific places. Yeah. Ah, oh, brilliant, that's amazing. Uh, so I think we have, um, a bit later, uh, they were taken outside and so you can let them go and mm -hmm. then what happens? And then when you shine the UV light on them, you can mm -hmm. see like, the little footprints and where the masses are in the field as well. Right, and what do you yeah. mean by masses? Um, it's basically like where most of the beetles would hide mm -hmm. and so instead of you know, using insecticides and spraying the whole field, you could spray it on that specific area. Right. So um, using the UV light and insecticides could be like a balance. Mm -hmm. So it's like using like 50-50 basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the, the UV is a way of tracking them. So the, the powder itself doesn't hurt the insects though, does no, it? No, it's, it's not harmful. No, we have a nice picture to show that it's yeah. non-toxic. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't harm the beetle. No, so you're able to put it on your, your faces yeah, and things yeah. and show. So I think that's a really nice kind of photo. It's a bit late at night and a bit blurry and things, but that's yeah. rather amazing. Um, what a fantastic thing to be able to do. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah. I did, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining me and telling me all about it. Um, yeah, just the visuals on that were just so exciting. Yeah. Um, so the next bit of footage we have is of you also. Uh, so this is collecting roots and things today? Yeah, mm -hmm. we were just looking at them um, underneath the microscope. Ah, oh, right. It had great detail. Yes? Yeah, I quite enjoyed it. And you learned about a completely different world again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I'm going to play that footage and uh, tomorrow uh, we've recorded an interview that we'll play tomorrow with the teachers that were working with you. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank Sophie, you for having me. Thank you. So what you can see here, as Sadia and Lorella have just changed position, but they were digging up soil all over the place um, and collecting uh, different roots and nodules and noting which tree species uh, this soil came out uh, came from under. But my next guest to hear, um, so we are now joined by Dan Foreman from the University Hi. of Swansea and Sarah, who's um, one of the teachers here with her students. Um, Thank you very much for joining me. Have you had a good day? It's been a brilliant day. It, it, it's been so inspiring to be out in nature, 
with such brilliant people mm -hmm. learning and showing them the world around and actually getting their impact, input and really seeing what excites them. I think that's the best thing about being a teacher, I think, really, is Definitely. It? Seeing, seeing the excitement. Engaged Absolutely. And finding new things. Yeah. And we're, we've literally just come to the field now. It's really caring. It's been a sticky day <laughs> and the horse flies have been out and it's been fun. Nature has a, a nasty side sometimes. <laughs> so what was the activity that you were um, looking at this afternoon? So what we were doing this afternoon, uh, we were, were covering quite a lot of ground really. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were talking about what conservation is and what it means to us and why we conserve and how we can monitor different populations of different organisms. Right. And we, we chose to focus on reptiles because mm -hmm. reptiles are often a very neglected group within the mm -hmm. United Kingdom and one of them has a particularly bad press as you would appreciate, our, our single venomous snake, <laughs> the adder. So we thought it would be interesting to get them to understand how we might look for such organisms mm. in the environment. So what we did was, uh, with the, the able assistance of many of the, the, the support help and the PhD mm. mentors, mm -hmm. is put down some of these refugia. You can see, I think you can see a picture of one now. You can see a very elegant Dr. Foreman with pointing <laughs> there, uh, lifting up one of these um, refugia to try and have a look. We, we, we were um, very interested in what we might find. And we never know when you come to a refugia What's going to be underneath? And were they reptiles? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and that in itself is an important lesson because part of what we were talking about was just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And perhaps the way we were approaching our monitoring for a conservation purpose was not as robust or as successful as it could have been. And we discussed why that might be. And I think that's an interesting thing. But under this particular thing, obviously you mentioned the wonderful downfall we had last night of rain. Uh, underneath this particular refugia, we were really fortunate enough to find a, a very young uh, field foal uh, with, with young, so just yeah. weaned. So we, we didn't disturb them for long, but it was a very interesting thing for the students to see that you will get other things underneath these things. It doesn't say reptiles only on the top. And I think that's one of the interesting things. It was a surprise to everyone. Mm. And, and it's amazing what you can find underneath pieces of cardboard and things like that that are out there. I, I urge people to look. You never know what you're going to find. Nature likes to hide. And underneath these lovely environments is a great place to be. Yeah, it was such a simple thing to do, but incredibly effective. I think the next picture we have um, is you talking to another one of our teachers. And so um, this week uh, is predominantly about the students and the experience that the students have um, and exposing them to a whole range of different um, opportunities and skills and explorations. But it's also a chance for the teachers to come along and learn as well and from us to learn yeah, from you. It definitely is great to speak to the different academics and find out about the latest research. So actually, we can go back to our classrooms and really inspire the next generation of scientists and say, look, this is what's going on and get them really excited and infused. And it's just been such a privilege to see the students engaging in all different areas of science and become really excited with things that they might have not heard of before or had any idea about. Um, so it's been really good. And also just network with other teachers and share ideas. Um, I know we've got teachers from science backgrounds, geography backgrounds, and actually looking at some of those cross-curricular ideas as well. Mm. And I found it very helpful and I've learned <laughs> quite a lot and really enjoyed talking to people. Um, let's have a look at the next picture we have. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about yeah, this? Yeah, we, we wandered through um, what was uh, some remnants of some ancient woodland, mm -hmm. effectively. And we were able to use our identification skills to actually look and identify plants that would tell us it's an ancient wood. Mm -hmm. Because the beauty of nature is it gives us lots of clues if you know what to look for. And we use a concept called ancient wood indicators. So these are plants whose presence in an environment suggests that there's been continuous woodland cover. Mm -hmm. So that makes this site a very important site because the older it is, the, the more continuous cover there's been, the more likely it is to be embellished with some really fantastic biodiversity. We may not have been looking at that, but we were showing the students that you don't look at everything. You can't look at everything. You don't have enough lifetimes to look at everything in one wood. But what you can do is you can look at three or four different things to give you an idea of what might be there. And that's a really important concept to introduce to students, that you don't look at everything, find out what things mean and, and look for those things. It's mm. really interesting. And it's a great site. And we were able to sort of explore the fact that there were some non-native plants in there as well, which are a potential threat to the ancient woodland there. So, for example, there was a lot of raspberry. Mm -hmm. uh, and most people don't think raspberry is not a problem. Well, raspberry, when it encroaches into woodlands and things like that, can actually start to take over native plants. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about that and how they got there, why they got there, and how we can stop things like that 
that in the future because ultimately we are creating problems for future generations to solve. That's very true. So this, this summer school is based at the um, Field Studies Council Mount Tarn uh, facility. So there's, we can see out the window over here the Tarn and there's a whole range of different ecosystems to explore in really quite a short area. So we've got this sort of ancient woodland, there's the bog, there's the Tarn, we were looking at rivers yesterday, we had the grasslands that the reptiles are in. It's a pretty great spot to be, um, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely. Around. You can't get a better place. There are few places on the planet, really, that you can explore such a myriad of different habitats. And obviously, within those different habitats, you have very different communities. Yeah. And that makes it very exciting and very permissible for us to actually access this for students to see. Mm. Ordinarily, you might have to travel hundreds of miles to find some of these different habitats. Yes. Mm. Whereas here, we can do it in one place. We're reducing that carbon footprint. Mm. Clearly, we need to do that. But we're also exposing them to these wonderful organisms in a small place that we can just walk to. What a great sign. Yeah, it's fantastic. So we still have, uh, oh, we've got a few minutes left. So one of the things I wanted to talk about that I think both of you do so brilliantly is, is motivating people. So that's not just your students, but other teachers, other scientists. Um, so I wanted to ask you how you motivate people and why you think motivation is important. I have I think for me, I just really enjoy science. I love the di a whole range of different things um, and just feel really privileged to be able to try and engage students and get them enthusiastic about things. Um, and there's so many great teachers out there um, and so many great potential teachers. That's been another great thing this week. We've got different mm -hmm. mentors and actually seeing them really come along in their presenting skills and talking to students and really engaging them is great to see. Um, because we always need more teachers, but actually enthusiastic teachers and teachers that are actually going to inspire the next generation. I know it's a bit cliche to say, but actually it's really important for them. No, I absolutely agree. How can you not be passionate and <laughs> about nature? Mm. We live on this brilliant planet. Every day I'm amazed, every day I'm inspired. I get up and I look at things, and I try to look through a child's eye every time I look at things and see that beauty, don't necessarily need to know what it is, I don't necessarily need to know its Latin name sometimes, just to experience that and be there. I think that's a wonderful thing and I love to share that passion and enthusiasm and knowledge and get people to, to put names to things that they've walked past for all of their lives and actually say, actually, that's this. And it's really important, they start seeing that and they start putting the names to them and they start recognising there are other plants and insects that they don't recognise and they look in a book and find out. And that's how this journey starts and we all start somewhere. You're not born an expert, you become an expert and it's a journey and I'm certainly not an expert. I think by the time I retire, maybe I might be. Seems like quite a few things. And many things, but I'm not sure. Um, but it, it's so, so, it, it's so invigorating to be amongst like-minded people as well, and we forget that because often we're all sitting alone in our little offices sometimes, or in our classes, and we forget we're part of a community. Mm. We're part of a really important, vibrant community that cares for people, cares for the planet, but cares for the, the things that don't have a voice. And I think that's such an important mission of myself and many of us around here is to put those voices on there. Mm. Can I ask you a little bit how you uh, about your career path? And we've been talking a lot about um, sort of options, career options in ecology and different. Um, I don't know too many ecologists who've had sort of a dead straight <laughs> path that seem to have you know really interesting backgrounds and things. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to have your current position? Yeah, well, I actually went through uh, school, did my A levels, uh, decided to do a degree in zoology, and actually uh -huh. that was my tutor. Amazing. <laughs> I feel really <laughs> old. <laughs> Um, and I went straight into teaching from there, I completed PGCE mm -hmm. and then went straight into teaching. I was slightly unsure what I wanted to do when I finished uni mm -hmm. and actually I fell in love with teaching um, mm -hmm. and just been teaching ever since. Um, it taught um, in different schools um, and actually gone through um, teaching uh, different sciences. I've taught 11 to 16 and now 11 to 18 mm -hmm. students as well. Um, and gone through different positions within school and actually I get to combine at the moment a, a, a head of year role which is more pastoral along with my passion for the science as well. Right. It's <laughs> it a pleasure to teach you as well. Though. Thank you. <laughs> For myself, I, I, I could be honest, I, I, I fell in love with nature from day one. Mm. Um, I went through my teens and I've got to be honest, I fell off the wagon a little bit with nature. It, it wasn't a cool thing uh, to do and I, I missed it. I, 
I really missed it. I didn't do very well at school because I didn't like the structure of school. But I went to college and did it independently. And in that independence, I thrived. Mm. I, I didn't like people asking me to do things. I wanted to drive them myself. Right. Uh, and it really worked for me. So I think the lesson I can say to people is don't worry if you don't get good marks straight away. You can find a way forward. It hasn't inhibited me or stopped me. And I've been very fortunate. I, I did a degree in environmental science, mm -hmm. which really allowed me to see the world around me in very different ways, including geography, including physics and chemistry, which I think has been a really interesting insight for me, becoming a zoologist ecologist now, because I'm able to dr drag in engineering and physics uh -huh. and all these other wonderful <laughs> subjects. <laughs> and they, com they complement each other. We yes. forget that. Yeah. Ecology is not in isolation. No, and there's a risk to, to putting it in isolation. I think broadening it out and obviously I've been fortunate enough to secure a position at a university and one of the greatest pleasures of being an academic, as I'm sure you will agree, is seeing the successes of your students and to be sat next to a, a graduate of mine who's an excellent teacher fills me with pride and reminds me that it's not just about the research, it's about people. Mm. Without good people, you can never make change. With the right people, with the right attitude, change is always possible. That's very, very true. I think the last image I have here that I'd like to cross to now is a student photo of the town. Um, so and you can see the lovely flowers and things in the foreground. One of the reasons I want to show that is because I think one of the interesting things this week has been getting to look through the students' eyes. So they've been, we've been sort of following them around with cameras and giving them <laughs> iPads and cameras and there's a photography competition running. So we're seeing what the students are seeing and their perspectives that I found inspiring, challenging, it's sort of different to my yeah. own perspective. I think, oh, I've never looked at things like yeah. that. That's extraordinary. Um, what do you think you've learned this week? What have I learned this week? That's such a big question. Um, just actually that there's so many areas and just actually everything can be an inspiration to someone and what one person finds interesting, someone else might not, but they'll find something else interesting and that's okay. And actually we need everyone having interests in a whole range of things to actually work together um, and it's actually been great to hear different acad academics working with people from different fields mm. um, so yeah, yesterday we had someone that was actually really interested in computer science and the geologists and the environmentalists all working together looking mm. at actually how um, floods can be reduced so that was really interesting as well. And I keep seeing different students sort of attracted to the different people visiting so yeah. when the session finishes it'll be someone different who's approached that person going oh that interested me or I like the way you're doing that so I think as diverse as the, the teaching staff are yeah. uh, it's sort of mirroring the diversity Absolutely. of the Definitely. Yeah, all right, so I think we're just about out of time. There are a couple of things I wanted to talk about before we wrap up. Um, so tomorrow, um, or tonight, uh, there's a few things happening. So I think they're going to set up some camera traps and, uh, and look at some mammals and things around. I heard someone saw an otter today. <laughs> I saw uh, an otter last night. <laughs> oh, uh, secretly, so I put it in the time. <laughs> so I'm incredibly <laughs> jealous of the students who saw an otter. Um, that's amazing. Uh, so looking at mammals, life in and around caves, so there's some cave journeys, so if you'd like to tune in tomorrow, um, you'll be able to hopefully see some great footage that students have captured and hear about their perspective uh, from the caves. Um, and revisiting those sort of large uh, global challenges that were, the students were talking about right at the beginning of the week and revisiting those and how ecology and people interact. Um, so I wanted to say, I don't think I've ever introduced myself, which is a bit of an oversight. So my name is Julia Cook, um, I'm a lecturer in ecology at the Open University. Um, and I wanted to just sign off, but also say thank you to the people behind the camera. So we have a couple of students behind the camera. So we've got Rhys and Sunny, who was here at the beginning, is now behind the camera. And Trevor as well from the Open University, who's making this happen. So thank you for joining us, for hearing both from the students and the people who are teaching them, uh, and we will see you tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.